Okay, hi everybody. My name is Michał Dominiak. Uh, most of you should by now know how to pronounce that. Uh, I work at Nokia Networks and I'd like to talk to you about customization points that suck less. And this doesn't mean that they don't suck. Uh, okay, so what is a customization point? A customization point is basically anything that allows us to uh, plug some custom behavior into a facility that, get, that exists. Uh, so this could be like a, an asso associated type, a function that should do something specific for our type, whatever. Uh, it's something that allows us to customize the behavior. Uh, yes? Um, just a clarifying question. So in, in uh, like boost ASIO and the networking TS customization point is used for very specific technique for doing this? Is, are you just referring to it in the more generic sense of so, so the question is, uh, the ASIO and networking TS have a very well-defined notion of a customization point. Is this that? Nope. Okay. It's like the more, more, like we've been talking about customization points for a very long time, right? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, so, so when I submitted this talk, I was like, yeah, maybe this wants to look very motivated. And then uh, Louis uh, made his uh, Dino repo repository public, and then there was a bunch of threads on both STD proposals and on the reflectors about basically this. But in virtually every place, uh, the uh, proposal, let's say, was to have like a separate me mechanism for runtime customization points and compile time customization points. I don't know why. I have a theory that I will like uh, reveal at some point, but <laughs> so is this a rant? Yes, uh, and no, and somewhat. Uh, no. So I am not very fond of macros, and you will see why this question is important. <laughs> All right, there is a couple of like ways that we already specify customization points. Uh, so say there is like the well-known technique of specializing a, tem a template. And there is, there is a couple of uh, standard stuff that actually uses this way of customizing their beha behavior. So standard hash. How do, how do we make standard hash work for this structure? Well, we specialize a structure. In namespace std, we create an operator call that has what we want. Uh, or we could write it like this, which is nicer, shorter. Everybody should write this, not this. And okay, so this is all nice, but what if we have like, what if the structure resides in the namespace? What's the next character I have to write to do the same thing? Exactly. I have to exit my namespace for to specialize the thing outside. Uh, I would ideally like to write this, but I cannot. I, I know there's been like talk about writing a proposal to allow this. I don't remember <coughs> who was saying that. I remember there was like a mention of, I'd like to make this work. That would be nice. That would solve a lot of problems. But that doesn't exist currently. So, so this is what we have to write. So like when you have multiple namespaces, then you have to exit every single one and specialize the thing and quite possibly open them again. Uh, this is made somewhat easier with C++ 17 because we can open multiple namespaces at, one, at once. It doesn't solve all, all problems, like if we have an inline namespace, we still have to open it separately. And if inside that inline namespace we have a namespace, we still have to open that separately. 
Uh, I know that some people prefer to like have a macro to open all of their namespaces. I don't like that very much. So this is a minor point. Like I know that most people won't care about this, but like uh, I have a use case where I have a header-only library that basically uses itself to test itself. But I want to use like one version that's installed to be the, on the testing side and another version on that side that's tested. So I include everything in namespaces test. That works with some additional includes prior to the namespace, but whatever. Uh, if, I have a if I have a specialization written like that, I cannot do this. Because I'm no longer at the global namespace and I cannot specialize a member of stand SD. Yes? How would that even work? If I mean, you can't even include anything from the standard library in that header, otherwise. Uh, yes, the, the, the comment is I cannot include anything from the standard library. What I do is I include everything that in, that's included inside those headers before the namespace test. I know it's a hack, <laughs> but it works. And to, having to write this specialization this way doesn't allow me to do this. Uh, so uh, there is this C++ 17 feature called uh, structured bindings, uh, which has uh, multiple customization points, let's say. So, so two of them are tuple size and tuple element, and those are basically uh, struct templates in namespace STD that you can specialize for your type. And so they are both defined in Tuple, and that header is, header is not freestanding. Like this is, a, this is not really like related to the rest of my arguments here, but I I do not like this. This is the runty part, uh, and you have to escape your own, all your namespaces, and go into <coughs> into standard. <coughs> so so this is why I don't like this way. Uh, all right. Does everybody know what ADL is? Or to say it differently, who doesn't know what ADL is? None of us really know ADL. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I'm not asking who knows how ADL works. <laughs> I'm asking whether there's somebody who doesn't know what it is. <laughs> like at, in an abstract way. All right. So, so we're going to like skip this and this. Uh, right, so, so we have this, like, this is all in namespace STD, right? We have this swap function, the uh, thing in the no except part is way too complicated to bother with it. Uh, and there is a function, one of the functions that use swap is called iter swap, which basically takes two iterators and swaps the values that are pointed to by those iterators. And the body of that function generally looks something like this. Which is not very nice. We have to import swap for some types like that don't have swap defined, but later on we use ADL to call the proper swap. That's in the user's namespace. <coughs> uh, this might not look like, like a big problem, but uh, try writing those two statements uh, inside a no except operator or uh, inside the expression that's passed to decal type. Have fun. So this is, this is like, no. Like, there is a reason for this design, I just, just wrong. So, so uh, another example of uh, ADL being used is actually not a part of the standard. It's a library that Zach gave a talk about on, on, on Tuesday. Yes? I was just wondering, but how would you do that in a decal type statement or something like that? Like this? I, I don't know. <laughs> you need a trace. Yeah, you, you, you're like, it's possible to do this. Like, it's it's possible to do this with uh, this, for example. This. Oh. 
Yeah, basically. How, how do we solve every problem we have? <laughs> every problem. Uh, all right. Uh, the comment was, how do I do this? And the answer is at a level of indirection. So, uh, Zach's talk. And it, uh, Yap is a, a template, uh, expression template library that allows you to have your user-defined types have a specialized behavior. <coughs> uh, for example, you implement eval plus. I, I hope I didn't like make a mistake here. Uh, to specialize what happens for operator plus in the expression template. But in, and this uses ADL and it works. But there is one slight problem that Zach mentioned. Uh, like, there is no way to make the uh, behavior different in different contexts. The ADL call to eval plus will always find this function and nothing else which is not very optimal. So there is another part of the uh, customization points of uh, structured bindings. <coughs> to actually get the element of, uh, of the object that you are binding to a name, you have to call get. <coughs> and get is selected only by using ADL. So at this point, when you are want to write a customized behavior for structured bindings, some parts of it will be in your namespace where your type is, and some part of it will be outside of those, all your namespaces inside namespace STD. Like, I remember the discussions about structured bindings and the point of the customization points aren't very good, was raised. But, we have what we have. Yes? Um, Structured bindings actually does this for a member get as well. Yes. Yeah, it's <coughs> okay, so the comment is that structured bindings also look for a member get. Okay, but. Yeah, okay, so so the comment is it first, it looks first for the member get and then uses ADL. All right, but the point still stands. You still have your customization points uh, into places. Yes. And this ADL only thing is something that we can do only through the compiler. There's no library ability to have a similar inject. Yes, the comment is that uh, this ADL only thing that structured bindings do is a compiler only thing, and we cannot actually write <laughs> write code to do this manually. Like, you could use structured bindings. <laughs> 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 yeah, it, it's limited to get, but. <laughs> Rage Space 4 also does this, so you can also have a beginning and end of your code. Yeah, the different. comment is that range based 4 is, does, the same, does the same thing. But range based 4 uh, doesn't require additional struct templates to be specialized somewhere else. Uh, so, so I'm sure uh, most of you have your like own reasons to dislike ADL. Uh, so, so I have this library where I have things, and I have optional in there, and I have make optional. And somewhere in the library, in the same namespace, I just call it make optional in some generic context because why would I qualify this? I am in the namespace. <laughs> So apparently, somehow, GCC 7.1 includes optional through some headers that I include. And somewhere else, I called the generic function and called, that called make optional with a vector, which made ADL kick in, which made my make optional and the standard make optional ambiguous. Yay, technology. Okay. Was it ambiguous and didn't compile? Uh, the question is, was it ambiguous? Yes, it was ambiguous. It didn't, it didn't compile, but it was irritating. <laughs> yes? I have another situation, something very similar to this. For a while, libstid C++ uh, had a make shared inside its implementation made an unqualified call to allocate shares. 
if you've ever used something from the boost main state and what happens to be including something like the boost shared pointer library, the boost shared pointer library has non-variadic versions and the boost one would be a better match. And so <laughs> oh, so so uh, I will I I will try to to repeat this. Correct me if I I go off track for uh, at any point. So so apparently lib stood C plus plus had a had a similar bug in make shared, mm -hmm. where it made an uh, unqualified call to allocate shared, and there was a boost version of allocate shared that was a better match than the standard one, which made it actually compile and do the wrong thing. It, well, it failed almost immediately, but that particular function was the one that crashed. But okay. it still failed at compile time. It oh, it still failed at compile it time. Failed. Okay, so all right. Good. Yeah, that's probably more annoying because fixing the standard library is kind of harder than fixing your own. Yes? Is there any reason why we cannot prioritize the one that's in the namespace we call it from? Even if I is there a reason why we cannot prioritize to the namespace we are calling from? Either swap would never call your overloads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sometimes it is what you want. Yeah, that's the whole. That's the whole situation. That would break everything that we intentionally use ADL for. Yeah. yeah, the comment is. Yeah, and the qu the question was, can we prioritize? And the answer was, it would break everything. And also, it's like, yeah. Okay, so so there was this paper that was written like two years ago. That's a long time. Uh, from Eric Nibler, where he suggested something for the standard library. So there's going to be code verbatim from the paper. Uh, so like, it's it's not very nice. Like, it uses those underscore underscore. So the idea is, you have some namespace details. You provide an overload for arrays and for whatever. Uh, and then you have a function object that makes an unqualified call to begin. In this case, begin. This always uses ADL. And then you would have some magic to avoid ODR violations. Uh, what was that? You don't need magic anymore. Yeah, the comment is you don't need magic anymore. Okay, I, as I said, I was. This is verbatim from the paper. Uh, and then you'd have a uh, at the namespace STD level, you would have a, uh, a uh, begin would be an object, not a function, <coughs> which means that a call to standard begin would be a call to the call operator of this object, which would mean that the only place where overload resolution is taking place is inside here, which is nice because we know what's going to happen. It's harder to make a mistake, like forgetting to write using std begin. Uh, this we can actually use inside like with, like with proper no accept and whatever. We can actually use this in the no accept operator without the problem uh, inside decal type and whatever. This is nice, but it, it kind of only works for functions. And there's other things we would like to be able to customize, like associate the types uh, or values. So you could argue that you could use functions to do that, but let's not go there. Okay, so so that's uh, two mechanisms for customization points that are currently used in the standard library and elsewhere. Uh, one proposed two years ago, I don't know, it was was it presented? Uh, it, was, it was an LWG paper, was it presented? Okay, so the comment is it was presented and there is some stuff that uses it. <coughs> uh, only, only in flight stuff, right? Nothing yes, that, uh, yeah. So I don't believe anything in Right. Well, I would say 
OEWD hasn't made any decision yet. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the comment is that OWG didn't make any decision, but certain paper authors decided to use it. Let's make a break from the earthly problems that we have. So, There was supposed to be like a conspiracy to put this image in every I, I, presentation. I, I first. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't have like I couldn't see it. Maybe it's like people. <laughs> Greed. <laughs> the comment was we should make t-shirts. So and this actually makes sense in this presentation. All right. Uh, so we had a keynote on this very interesting language where this is valid code. So Haskell, we can write this and one is basically one. You can think of it as the variable or as a nullary function or just as another name for one, whichever works for you. So, so we can have functions. Uh, this function takes two arguments. Uh, doesn't give the name to the second one. This is, this is the ver explanation for the C++ programmers, okay? Uh, <laughs> it doesn't name the second one, and then we have another function that partially applies one argument to the function with two arguments, and const 12 of ABC returns 12, but it really means that the value of this expression is 12. It doesn't really return anything. Uh, this is actually, uh, okay, so we could like explicitly say what the type is. And we could do the same for the function. This is a function that takes an argument and returns a function that takes an argument and returns something. Uh, so, so we take A and B and return an A. That's the probably easiest way to read this. Uh, and we say that const 12 takes an A, so it takes any type. This is like, you don't have to introduce a type with a type name like in C++, you just say A. And it returns an int. Although this is like manually specified type, and this, is, this isn't actually what it is. So one is actually this. And it depends on the context what it is. And the function is actually this. Because an integer literal isn't an int. It's a polymorphic value that can be converted to anything that is num. What, an, what num is, is a type class. Define some, like, I, I, I think it's exactly like it's defined in prelude, but I'm not sure. I might have taken something else. So we can, you can, what this says is anything that wants to be a num has to provide a plus operator, a minus operator, a star operator. Uh, you have to be able to negate the value. You have to be able to take the absolute value. You have to have a conversion from integer. This is, this is what's used by the language to actually turn a, an integer literal into a num. And then you have some functions that have default definitions. So x minus one is x plus negate y, right? This specifies an interface, right? What? Uh, uh, hold that thought. <laughs> So we can create a data type. Let's do complex because complex is a thing that generic programmers like to demonstrate why complex is nice. Why generic programming and generic data structures are nice. So we have a type that's called complex. It's parameterized by a type and it has a constructor that's called complex and it takes two arguments of type A. This can look confusing, right? But Haskell basically has multiple namespaces for, for different things. So complex 
when you want a type, then complex will mean a type, and when you want a value, it will mean the constructor. And we can create a variable of the type that works. Oh, look. Type deduction for constructors. You don't, you don't need guides. <laughs> so we can create an instance of num for this com complex class. So, uh, uh, so like I don't know. Uh, okay, I guess it should be visible. So we say that provided that a is num. So we say that we want a type that is itself a num. We can say that complex is all, of A is also num. And here's how we define the required oper operations. Uh, like Everybody knows how to multiply complex numbers, right? Uh, OK, so we can like have the foo, take the foo and subtract a, another complex number from it. We can take that and add one because we have a conversion from one to a complex. That works. And actually, we could strike this because we have a default implementation for minus. Because we define negate. OK. There, yes. I didn't define apps for complex. Yes, you are correct. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, you see negate. Uh, oh, apps for complex. Okay, the comment is I didn't implement ABS. Just say true middle. <laughs> that is true. And it would like break the perfect order of my slides. Like the, I would need to get rid of that break to have the, the same font size. Let's ignore this. Okay. Uh, uh, when, when I have two interludes, one after the other, is it still interludes or? <laughs> So uh, C++ OX concepts. Uh, I might be wrong like on those slides because I was working with like very d d small d d sized uh, documentation samples. So there's a number of people here who can correct me when I get things wrong. So do it, go it if I do it wrong. So the auto in front there says that this concept can be deduced for a type when all the syntactic requirements are fulfilled. And the only syntactic requirement we have for this concept is that we can call operator less than on two values of type T and get a, a Boolean. Is it a Boolean or anything that's convertible to Boolean? It's anything yeah. convertible, but from within the context of a constrained definition, you will always see a Boolean. <laughs> yes, it's a complicated way of saying that doesn't matter, thank you. Uh, and then we can write this. Like, like this looks familiar, familiar, right? Like at least this syntax doesn't, didn't change much. What? <laughs> I said this is a rant. And there is like a whole part of the presentation about this certain topic. Uh, we could write something like the num we had, right? And then we could write a complex type. And then we could define what it means for operator plus of the concept num to mean, uh, of the concept num to mean for a complex. And this is what was called concept maps. So uh, before we move on, have you seen on, in this conference anything that looks alike to those two things? I'm expecting two answers. Traits and inputs. 
in Rust. In yes, trades in Rust and type classes. In type like I had type classes here. Okay. I'm expecting one other thing. Luis talk. Yes, Luis's talk. Is it Luis's or Luis? <laughs> <laughs> I for I forgot to ask him. How French you are. <laughs> 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 Of Louis, so we can add the tick S and Louis, I guess. Yeah, the talk of Louis. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the, the comment was to say the talk of Louis and that it depends on how French am I. All right, so, so like we've seen some stuff that looked like this, right? So I, I probably should have like uh, repeated this slide, but I didn't. Shame on me. No one else troubled by the one thing that doesn't look like this is the concept that we're actually... Yeah, sure. Wait, wait, we will get to this. Don't spoil the future slides of my talk. Okay. Does anybody have questions at this point? Except the one that Bryce just asked. Like, why did they reject <laughs> concept maps? Uh, I I think the answer to the question of why were concept map rejected was like the compile times were horrible. Was that <laughs> it? So there were a wide variety of reasons. And yeah. With complexity of what the feature was doing, that we we wanted a simpler feature. Yeah. So the comment is we wanted a simpler feature. Okay. So the comment was, we wanted a simpler feature to get enough consensus to get to get it into the standard. Oh wait. <laughs> I will also flag there was a strong preference from the folks championing concepts that prefer implicit over explicit. And that's for language features in general, so they prefer the implicit. Concept, implicit. They prefer implicit. Okay, so so the comment is that there was a strong uh, opinion to from the authors of the proposal to prefer implicit over explicit. Yeah, as a general language principle. As a general as a general language principle. Okay, that this could be a very long discussion about this point. And that, I think, I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem. We, I, I think we have plenty of time still. Uh, all right. So, so I had some observation, like <laughs> observations, like we can specialize a member of the current namespace, right? No problem. And a member of a member of the current namespace, where the member of the current namespace may be a type, maybe a type template, maybe a namespace, whatever. Uh, so. Like by default, we would look into the customization point, not into the type that the user provides. Uh, but we are defining a type that's in the current namespace, which means we could specialize a member of the type we are currently defining without exiting the current namespace. And I could like end the talk now and you would have to figure this out, but. Uh, so, let's have a tuple size somewhere that will look inside the type that we are asking about. I call the uh, member of the type tuple size instance, borrowing the name from Haskell. Like Haskell has instances, right? Uh, so, we say that the tuple size is 17 for whatever reason. Uh, we can make this like slightly more generic. Why this is useful will become very obvious later on. But basically, I can specialize the instance member and I can specialize it in any way I want. If I want, like here I'm using a tag for, for the specific type class, let's say, that I'm specializing for. But I could like, 
this allows me to write the same specialization for multiple type classes. Why that would be useful, I don't know, but it's possible. Is this like obvious to everybody? Yes. Just one comment. There is a difference. Not, it's not necessarily a good thing or a bad thing, uh, but this would require that at the time that this is being instantiated, that T is a complete type because it has to look into T. Whereas normally, if you specialize something, you don't need the type to be complete. So the effect of that is that it would mean that you cannot directly and indirectly rely on this from within the type list. The comment is that this requires T to be special, to be complete. Uh, I guess so. It's, it's not a comment of it being positive or negative, it's just that it's yeah. it is, it is but, a, a difference. Uh, I haven't found like a problem with that. Right. Okay. The only thing I could think of, of is if, if indirectly, like in the type, in like the, the return type or something, something indirectly is depending on the on that specific trait. But it's probably unlikely, but it is a difference. Yeah, so the comment is that this this will not work if inside the type definition uh, we are depending on a concrete value or a type or whatever from the instance. That is true, yes. Uh, Gor. No? Okay. So this requires the, the creators of the types to find an alias inside the type itself that can allow the distinction. Uh, this requires the creators of the class to create a you said an alias, I will say a struct template inside their implementation, yes. And I haven't found any other way to make it possible to like write this in a sensible way, so without escaping everything. So, so this is actually a good point that we will get to in a minute, that will tie us in with one of the keynotes. Uh, if, does everybody understand the, te the template keyword after the colon colon? Does anybody not understand what it is? So this is like a very strange group. <laughs> yes? Can you explain again why, why instance would be useful here compared to the simple version? Uh, can I explain why instance would, would be useful here compared to the previous uh, version? Uh, like. <laughs> I don't know if I can explain it without going a few slides forward. Okay. Yeah, yeah. My count previously was that you can like reuse the same specialization for say multiple type classes. Mm -hmm. This could potentially be useful. Like I can see a use case for this. Okay. And it's more like general than the previous one, so it's generally better. Yes. What if multiple types are involved in the trait that you're specifying? What if multiple types are involved in the trait I'm specifying? I haven't gotten to multiple ar to multi-argument type classes yet. Like yes, it would be basically t some type names there, but I like some of the macros that I'm going to show you don't work with that. <laughs> So when manually expanding all that, you could do this, yes. So um, if this seems like it provides a benefit mainly when you're defining the trait immediately after, along with the class definition, right? This seems like it provides a benefit when I'm declaring a trait directly with a class definition, no. This provides a benefit when I'm either defining the Trait or a type class or whatever, or when I'm defining the type. I mean, it, it provides benefits when you're defining them together over having a separate specialization in the original namespace of the trait. Mm. Because now you don't have to exit the namespace. That seems like the main no, thing. like like this is the the trait is in a different namespace. Yes, it could be somewhere else. Like yes. so, it seems like using this instance inside of Baz is. A benefit over specializing people size only when you're putting these specializations right with your definition as the struct. I I'm not sure if I follow. Because, because you still have to put the specializations. The only benefit is that now you don't have to exit your name. Yes, the only benefit is that you don't have to exit the namespaces. Yes. Okay. So that's that's the goal. Okay. So. 
how is this a benefit over something like iterator trace, which you can either specialize it or access the members of the struct, of the class, and just do it as a member, or if you're... Just, can we go on, and I hope that some of those questions will be answered in like a few slides. Okay, so everybody understands what's going on here, right? Okay. And did I have two slides that are identical? How yeah. did this how did this happen? Yeah. Right. So there's a friendly marker for this. <laughs> <laughs> like it's a bit of an oxymoron. <laughs> no, 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 no. But look, look. <laughs> This isn't that bad, right? I hope you agreed it's not that bad. Like you say instance, type class, type, and you define it. The only problem with this I have is that like I basically have to slap clank format off and clank format on around this. <laughs> because clank doesn't exactly understand what's going on and the formatting gets funky. But I can live with that. So let's create a default instance. Do I need a template as a disambiguator? Do I need, I think I need the template. Uh, after the T colon colon template instance. I, do I not need the template? I think you might, but I don't, and maybe it's understood in that context. Yeah, to me, yeah. it looks like you need template. It's not a big He's talking about the uh, the bottom part, not the right. Like it says triple sizes and opening the brackets. Yeah, you definitely yeah. need at least half one. I, don't, I will reject these things at the point where I was talking about. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. oh, okay, yeah. that makes sense. Uh, you don't need a you don't need a template there. Okay. So, I'm still reaching into the type. So even though I provided the default instance, I have to like explicitly opt in. So this is kind of like a C++ OX concept without auto or a Haskell type class by default. Is everybody okay with this? So how would I use the default? This is how you use here, is it? How would you use the default? Bas uses the default value. Bus inherits the instance from tuple size. Oh, okay. Thanks. Should it be tuple size bus? Should it be what? Bus inherits from tuple size bus. Curious Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, yes, this slide is wrong. Yeah, the last one. Yes. Better. Yes, it should look something like this slide, so uh, yes, I made a <coughs> silly mistake. Uh, so basically there should be like, yeah. Um, so in the instance, the bottom instance one takes tuple size T and T, the top one is tuple size T, is, what, is that? Uh, okay, so, so to clarify Vittorio's problem with this, uh, that template type name class, uh, type name type class, type name u struct instance should be in a separate struct that is not a template. And that struct should be used as the uh, argument to everything. Yes, I'm wrong on the slide. This? So that one, that one takes, the instance takes two tuple, tuple, tuple arguments there, right? Tuple yes. This should be, this should be tuple size underscore, tuple underscore size underscore TC, like we had previously. Oh, 
this, yeah, this is this is a pro. Yeah, he screwed up. Yes, this this slide doesn't suck less. It sucks more. It sucks more. Yes, yes. Sorry. No, it's supposed to be tuple size underscore TC. No, the last one. On the very last one. Yes. <laughs> oh, wait. Oh, okay. Yes, so. So I should have, I should have had this on that slide instead of the instance inside tuple size. Sorry. Does it make sense now? If, except the TC instance part is not yet known. So, okay, there, this is probably like one of the craziest slides on this presentation. I have like one, two, three, four, five, seven disambiguators. Okay, so I'm going to try to explain this. So, so the last the last two lines are just an alias for the thing above, right? Ignore that. Uh, like it could be type class trait underscore t and. So, so the, the, the primary template uh, says we will reach into the type class itself to find an instance. Mm -hmm. And if there is an instance defined for those two arguments, for this type class and for the, this t, then we will use that. The specialization says if within the type itself there exists an instance that matches this, so that takes this type class and this T, then we will use that. It uses void T to, like, it repeats itself twice, not thrice, but don't worry, we will have code that where expressions repeat three times, yes. In short, first look into the type. If it's not in the type, look in the type. Yes. Okay. In short, first look into the type, then look into the type class. Yes. That's all this is doing. Like, the code is crazy, but like you write this once. <coughs> like, I wrote this. You don't have to. Does anybody have a problem with this? Yes, but not. <laughs> <laughs> So, so the comment is that Alice there has a problem with this, but not with understanding this. Not the, understanding the intent. I'm not broken the syntax on the fly. I'm sorry, but yeah, okay. I got the intent. Okay, so, yeah. That I know, like right, C plus plus. Okay, so so uh, now I'd like to write a instance that works without having to like inherit from the type class. So I'm writing auto concept now. Or Haskell's how is it? Uh, uh, how is it in Haskell? Like deriving. deriving, yes, thank you. That's the keyword I was looking for. Wait, sorry, can you go back to the previous slide? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Do you think if we had something like So, so basically, the question is whether I want uh, Andre's uh, static if. Right. I I kind of do, but I kind of don't. Like it would. It would be a little bit shorter. It would be a little <laughs> bit shorter, but it has its own problems. Yeah. Yes. What you what you could do if you want the imperative syntax is use something like Hannah's type value encoding and use its constructor and then return a wrapped type. Okay, I'm going to tell you something else. I could ho I could have used the detection idiom. Yeah, yeah, Mar yeah. Marshall is not here, right? I could have used the detection idiom, and it would like look easier. But at the point I was writing this, I didn't know it like existed, so I wrote this, and it's kind of basically the, the detection idiom, but in line. <laughs> yes. So, back to what, what, what I was saying. I want an implicit instance. So, 
the default instance will be zero, but for whatever reason I decided that for vectors, the tuple size is going to be 17. I, I like 17. I, it makes no sense whatsoever, but why not? So, this last specialization has to be written in the namespace of the trait. The previous one too, but... So, so basically, when you have a third-party type class or a trait or a concept or whatever, and you have a third-party type, then the syntax is not very nice and you still have to escape all the namespaces. Sorry, I don't have an answer for that, but I'm slightly less sorry about this after the Rust keynote, where we learned that you have to own either the trait or the type to specialize the trait for the type, which I think makes sense. So basically being in the namespace of the trait kind of means that you own the trait. Being in the namespace of the type means you own the type. Makes sense? Okay, no, nobody is yelling no. Uh, okay, so there is a handy macro for <laughs> the default instance. So, so this is one of the places where like, I don't have an obvious answer for multi-param multi type classes. Because basically I have to do, like, instead of having like a single argument for the type, which I later expand into basically type name and the second argument, I would have to have two, like, I would have to have two arguments that are in parents. Uh, yeah, like two one element preprocessor tuples. One for the declaration of the template arguments, one for the actual usage, right? This macro? Can I get? Macro? This is a variadic macro. <laughs> so, this isn't that bad, right? Like, it's better than writing this. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> like, here, you had to repeat double size TC twice. So the comment is the problem is that this is a macro. Yes, I would like a proper code generation tool in C++. I have macros, sorry. That's, I use what I have. I, I didn't want to invent like a language feature for this. If we had a language feature, then I wouldn't have to write this. All right, we have a default instance. So, so like the creation of the uh, structure is kind of tiresome too. So there's a macro, uh, and like let's introduce swappable. So this up, this on the top is like a concept for swappable. Uh, I use this. Uh, I use it as a tag for this concept and. This thing at the bottom, I, I didn't even try to fit this on the slide. Like, this is so bad. This is so bad. Like, if at least no except was a Sphina context, that would be kind of okay, but it isn't. It is now. It is now? Yeah, in 17. Oh. Yeah. Oh. As it becomes a part of the function type, it's now on an, it, There was some debate if it already was and just wasn't implemented, but it's, it's now officially a part of the... Okay, so the comment is that no except is now a Sphina context, but that's still bad. I want like no except auto, and <laughs> that, that accidentally gives me like, <laughs> that accidentally gives me like the, the definition checking, like no except auto, accidentally. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> so I, I don't want to write this, I trust. Right, this you've you've seen a function that does basically this same thing. I I don't think there's like a possible divergence here. If you if you don't know how this works, it basically expands to this. Because why would I write the same expression thrice? All right, so here this swap is the interface function, right? So this is the function that the end user would call. 
And it uses TC instance to grab the specialization for the type and uses the swap that's inside. Yes? Are you missing pair of parentheses? It is the comma between swappable and C is going to turn yeah. those into two macro parameters. So you need another set Am of I system. missing? No. no I can Sphene that. function is a variadic macro. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll happily just. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So the comment is, was this doesn't work, and my answer is it works because Sphine. Did it work? So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Sphine function is a variadic macro. I should speed up a little, probably. So we can so we can define the default swap, right? So it wouldn't actually look like this. Uh, it's like crazy amounts of no accept and uh, like uh, Sphine non stuff. But this is basically your uh, standard swap, right? This is how everybody writes swap. Is this okay with everybody? Then we, we can, yes. Just a second, so all of that machine in the same way, you will not have to move away from the main space to the wall of the frame. Yes. <laughs> Just double check. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but this is not the end of the talk yet. <laughs> yeah, the, the question was whether this all this machinery is all just to not have to like escape all the namespaces. Uh, the, 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 the yes. <laughs> Come again? I, I didn't hear you. I want to hear you. All right. Uh, so, it, uh, except this may be looking uh, a bit like too complicated for this. Does anybody have a problem with this or doesn't understand something up to this point? Because it's going to get like funny now. Right. So templates are horrible. Like templates are the worst. So so this is like the interface I would like for a generic counter thing. I can set a value of the given type. I can get the value of the given type and I can increment and get the increment incremented value of this type. This is like not used but just to show the interface I'm aiming for. Uh, so, like, I can, like, this is, this is the interface from the actual point of view, like set value, the same is created for get value increment, whatever. Uh, so, I create a default instance. And like, th th this is obvious, right? I hope. So I, I want an atomic counter. I want the value that's inside to be an atomic of the argument. So I write this, but my interface isn't exactly the same as I'm expecting here, right? Increment expects me to have a prefix uh, increment operator. So I would like to adapt. And I would like not to have to repeat all those functions again. So what I do is I write this, right? So instance under the hood like inherits from the default instance. So I can reuse the default uh, implementations for functions and default values and default types. <coughs> it's somewhere in the macros. Can anyone try to guess whether this works? Oh, uh, well. It was not supposed to be you. <laughs> yes, that's correct. So it was. <laughs> yeah. Do you need a template disambiguator? Do I need a template disambiguator? Where? Uh, no, no. You don't have the specific number parameters. 
Somewhere in the macro, maybe. Yeah, so, so, so basically what the U should have been is atomic counter of T. Oh, okay. Right, so does anybody want to guess what's the error here? Ignoring the obvious one. I didn't show it. <laughs> That's oh, <a> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice, right? <laughs> so, uh, so that all that basically expands to this, like plus some other stuff. Uh, I have atomic counter, and inside I have a template. But atomic counter is a template. And I'm trying to partially specialize like a member template of a template. And this doesn't work. <laughs> so add one, add one more layer? I, yes. <laughs> the question was whether I will add another layer. Of course, why not? Yes, <laughs> like th this weird this weird thing in the parents is like the preprocessor tuple that we were talking about <coughs> previously. Like it's a one element tuple. It's not very interesting, but basically this allows you to have like a vari another variadic argument to the macro, which is nice. This works and. This works, except I again have you. I don't know why. <coughs> uh, and this should not be a silly wrapper. Oh, mm -hmm. that this is this is how it ends when you like copy the code from your tests and then uh, don't align it with the types you've used on the previous slides. But imagine it's an atomic counter and then. Uh, atomic counter of T and then atomic counter of T. Hopefully that's uh, easy to do. Like, are you trying to like make a photo of this slide? Uh, no, no, no. Thank you. <laughs> 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 of this slide? Thank you. <laughs> All right, so let's see some macros. This is like the macro metaprogramming part of the talk. This is the first time I actually did like something you could call macro metaprogramming. It was horrible, but it works. So, so instance template helper. So this little thing we had above there is just a struct. This struct exists because I want to have something that I can specialize in the current namespace. Uh, this is the thing that's inside the class. So I'm basically inheriting from a specialization of that uh, instance helper. This is this one additional layer of indirection, right? And this is instance template. So I basically specialize that thing and inherit and inherit from the default implementation. Yes. What is only? What is only? Very good question. <laughs> Only is a macro that takes a single argument and returns that argument. So, template like template decal is a tuple. So it's open parent, something close parent. So after macro uh, substitution, this reads template uh, angle bracket only parents something parents angle bracket which later gets expanded because it's a macro with a single argument there's a bunch of those how, 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 on a scale from 0 to like 10 how terrible is this i love it yeah i, mean, I, love, it. I love it too right? yeah yeah go uh, cool, cool what yeah. the only I don't think it's. I think that template is necessary. I think it's a repo. Yeah, 
Yeah, I what? Think, I, don't, I, I don't think it's allowed that. I don't think it's allowed. It compiles that. on both GCC and. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 it compiles like this template. I, the the comment is about this. Yeah, like, I, I think I need this. Yeah. Uh, I think I need this. Yeah. And yeah. it compiles on GCC 6 and Clang uh, 3.9 and Clang 4.0. It belongs to the previous yeah. line. Because, yeah. Okay. You don't so, need type name. I think I need the template. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry, that was wrong. Not that that was a fine degree out of myself, but yeah. Yeah. It, it, I'm pretty sure it doesn't compile without it. Yeah. From zero to ten, I'd say animal cruelty. From zero to ten, animal cruelty. Uh, where is that above or below? Uh, is that is no no no? Is that above or below uh, concept slide? As a matter of fact, this is pretty simple. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that sounds like a challenge. I mean, people in this room have like implemented concepts and macros. <laughs> some people, yes, some people might have done that. Yes, you you will be mentioned. Okay, so so let's do something different. Let's do type erasure. And unlike some other mechanisms for type erasure. I will actually use the same customization point mechanism for compile time and for runtime. And I'm, and I'm going to use this as the definition. Like, this is, this is how you specify the interface. So hash is an abominable function? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I was looking at people who, who clicked that they were going to be here, and I was like, "Thank God, Alistair isn't going to be here." <laughs> <laughs> so why I do this? Well, like, so, so, who, uh, how many of you don't didn't know that you could uh, that you can put a const there? It's like some people. It's like more people. <laughs> Uh, not very much. <laughs> so, so I want to type a race, right? So I don't know the exact the exact type. I want this to be a member function. So, so the constant part actually isn't implemented yet, but I know how to do this. So I'm showing you like the uh, ideal interface. Uh, so I cannot like use a member function type that's const here because I don't know the type of of which it would be a member of. So I'm basically using this weird language mechanism that doesn't do very much and that some people don't like very much to say that the this argument for this function will be const without actually spelling its type. <coughs> There's a standards proposal that does something very similar for stood function. There is a standards proposal that does something very similar for std function. Yes. Do you still hate this? Or? I hate abominable functions, but it doesn't mean they don't exist. I have to live with them. Do you, do you hate the use? I'm not sure what you're doing with it yet. That, like I, this. <laughs> so I say that I have a type class that's called hashable, which means that I will use, use hashable underscore definition as the interface. And that is, it has a member called hash that I want in the interface. And then I have the top level interface. Like I don't have to like create that uh, instance inside. This magic macro, the find type class, does all this for us. I'm not actually going to show you like all the macros because that wouldn't, like, like I would need, another slot to go for them <laughs> but they are kind of repeatable so so I can like assuming we have an instance of hashable for for integers I can do this I can do both of those because hashable erased which is the type erasure wrapper is also an instance of hashable yes Bryce is this, is this uniform <laughs> <laughs> 
the, the question is whether this is the uniform call syntax. No, it isn't. <laughs> Those are totally different functions. Like the second function calls, calls the first function underneath. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> so I also have something I call arrays ref so I can have a reference. There's a lot of stuff that, that can be done with this, right? Like a lot of stuff. And as I said, uh, I don't actually like in the implementation use the const on the function type. Although I have like most of the machinery I need for this. Uh, I'd need a heck lo a lot more boilerplate for it to work. I, it's basically like copy paste some code and change same change some names and add some more invocation of some macros and that would work. Yeah, I'm not grokking what erased ref is. Is that going to affect me on future slides? Erased ref? Yeah, the hashable erased. It's a reference. Like erased, erased, uh, erased just copies the value. Erased ref uh, keeps a reference. So it's like so so the, the so the thing on the top is basically like function and the thing on the bottom is like function ref. Yes. So erased ref is a bound in the first place. Uh, you bound the erase you bound the hashable interface to two. But you haven't done anything to get copy to two or own two or change an array from one to two, right? Yes. So so the question was whether I bound uh, the other way actually. I bound foo to the hashable interface. Well same way. Same difference, yeah, sure. Is everybody okay with this? Is this nice? And I can define the type class, like define the, inst define the instance for anything and it will just work with this. So there's some macros underneath. Like concat free should be pretty like obvious. Uh, virtual destructor is silly, but saves some lines of code actually. I think. Uh, so, uh, uh, who here doesn't know how type erasure is usually implemented? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, that, that, that. yeah, he only knows his way, not the usual way. <laughs> I'll say, I'm not the usual way. I know too many ways. So. Yeah. So, so typically, you have a base class that has some virtual interface, and then you inherit from that, inherit a template from that that's parameterized on the actual type that you are going to hold inside. So, this basically like, this is a mixing for making the base class have a function called memname. Memfn name, where memfn name <laughs> is a is a parameter to the macro. I I need to do this for every name that I have in the interface. Yes, I have to do this for every name I have in the interface because I don't have ID reflex bro. Uh, no, I'm a little confused that the the text <laughs> Ignore it. <laughs> and it makes sure that base has like a virtual destructor. No, 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 no. It's been like, like, there's been some problems I had during implementation, and this is how I fixed them, okay? Let's not go into them. <laughs> yes. What? Where do you oh wait. <laughs> so 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 this is a thing. Uh, this is a thing. So is that type base, type class, base, base class? <laughs> type class, base, base class. Okay. So, so there is some there is some weirdness there, right? Like exp explode, explode is a thing that takes a function type and takes a template and 
explodes the function type into the template. So the template gets instantiated with the uh, return type and then all the argument types. And when I will get to implementing that, it will also get some booleans that say whether the function is const or ref qualified or volatile or whatever. Is that in the Yes. The, the, the ignore this. <laughs> So, 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 like, like in the summary, I have like a single line that says why this is wrong and what I could use it instead. Yes. This is this is the base class, right? Like, well. As embarrassing it is, as it is, I've, I've implemented almost this exact same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so Matt says I, I basically repeated his previous work. No, I don't know why you're embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> so does everybody know how boost pp sec for each works? Yeah. Who doesn't? I don't care as long as it works. Yeah, you are, you are, you are, you are very, you are happy people. So, so uh, it takes it takes like a couple of things, and it's, it has like a way to pass in a single context argument. But I want to pass like two things, like the type class name and the template args. <coughs> so I just make a tuple of two elements, and then somewhere there, uh, I use like first and second that work by the same like mechanism are like uh, as uh, only. This is like weird stuff. Like I, I, oh, I actually need this virtual destructor here or like anything because boost pp seek for each uh, gives me the expansion for the first argument, comma, for the second argument, comma, for the last argument, comma. Yes. That's why in the, at, in the thing you put something like comma if, so you only have a comma, so you only have a comma after the first one. Yeah. So, so the argument is that you can do this differently. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> the, this works. And I, like, <coughs> I where oh I'm this this slice is actually meant to be repeated like this is not very nice right like I, I have to do this for every member function name that I have inside every single one every single one Yes, if I handle CV qualifiers, then it's uh, <laughs> uh, const yep. times volatile times ref times ref ref. Did I forget something? No except. No except. Did I forget something? Const ref. Okay. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I'm. It's like oh. thirty-two. Yeah. yeah, it explodes. You can't have ref and ref ref. It's only, you multiply by three, not by four. There. Oh. Well, yeah, that's that, then, that's, <laughs> that's 16, oh, so that, that's not many, yeah. So, so I would like to have a reflection with actual like generation of identifiers. It almost sometimes goes up there with C-style ellipses, I'm not sure whether they're... Uh, C-style where? So, um, Are, that's when the usual exponential function type, C-style ellipses, usually ends up showing as an extra thing you have to, but I'm not sure if it's easy or not. Oh, oh the so argument bad. is... That, so the comment is that if Rx is empty, then I have a C style no, ellipsis. No. If you no. If you want no. To support C oh, if I want C to have. Oh, 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 yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. So I would like to have reflection, right? I, I, so I could just write this. Like I, I can enumerate all the member types. I can do everything for that and. If I had some meta object, I'm, I'm completely like inventing this syntax here. Like, except idea flexible. It's probably get name m something. 
uh, I could just generate an identifier there based on the template argument. That would be great. So uh, Jackie had a talk on the reflection. It was pretty good. So go, yeah, <laughs> go, 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 go watch it once it's online. Okay, so, so I theoretically have like a minute. Yes. But this is the last session so we can go go a little bit over time. You actually have more time than you think you have. So yeah. if you have more time than Bryce told you what you have. So. Do I? <laughs> oh, I do. <laughs> you liar. <laughs> you liar. <laughs> Okay, so 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 there is this beautiful thing that's called a concept TS yes, uh, that was supposed to be a vessel for for trying out a feature and then modifying it and then maybe t putting it into the standard that hasn't exactly worked out. Uh, so so there is a crash course on concept TS. Yes. You can write like the most useless concept ever. That's always true. Uh, you can write a concept that requires that T has any member function called foo that's callable with no arguments. Uh, you could also write like a concept that checks whether a T has a function called foo that's callable with no arguments that returns, uh, is it returns void or returns something that's convertible to void? Uh, Convertible, contextually convertible to whatever the thing is. But so, so, so this would basically be anything, right? Uh, are I, yeah, I, are these two equivalent? That's what I'm asking. They are. Okay. This is this is a crash course on the TS. Like. So, so my question is, which one of those wins when you do concept overloading, like overloading on concepts? I, I actually think the last one, like I, it is contextually convertible, but I actually think that the last one will only last if it returns. No. So which one, <laughs> which one wins when I overload on these? Can can somebody like does anybody know? Yeah. I think I think that yeah. I think okay. I think so, so the comment is that the second one is the third one is more specialized in a way. Yeah. So it would but be a better match. That might be true. It might not be true. But not because but not because foo has void returns. It's yeah. Because, <laughs> yeah. Just because there's more text. Just yeah. Just because it's more text, so it it should win, right? <laughs> it's bigger. So so I wanted to try like I haven't actually implemented like I got to a way of generating things, uh, but I haven't actually implemented this fully. Like I have a proof of concept, but I like I tr started trying yesterday, and I started with this. Like like I need this right. I need a, fun a concept that checks whether my member function of the name foo. Uh, is callable with those arguments and results in something convertible to a return. Of course, I would have this under macros that fill the function name in, but... <laughs> so, so, I wrote this and then I was like, how do I explode into this thing? Like... So, so... Unless I'm wrong, you cannot take a concept as a template argument. No, um, it's an intentional design decision. What, really? Why? It was also it was also an intentional design decision in OX. The word versus code. <laughs> but but this is so so so. So so the comment was that this was intentional in both the TS and C plus plus OX. But I want to do this. Well, like, I, I, yeah, this I have to do this because, this yeah, yeah, but because then I like tried like for templates I do this right, like when I'm writing this template, yeah. I write a primary template. But uh, who can tell me what's the uh, uh, compiler error message for this? Oh, oh, oh. 
No, it's... <laughs> Weirdly, it's not an internal compiler er error, and weirdly, you are wrong. This is GCC. I don't know which, I don't remember. Might have been six, might have been seven. I couldn't specialize a concept, like, the, right? This was like intentional. So what 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 else? It like, says variable concepts. Have you tried it to make it a function? <laughs> Have I tried? Make it into a function. Why why are you why 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 are you looking into my future slides? <laughs> who, who can tell me what, what's the error message here? I'm I'm trying to pattern match on the fa function type, right? Who can tell me what's the error message? Nobody? Have you not tried the greatest yeah. compiler ever with F concepts? Yeah, I think you should have empty yeah. a set of empty prints after has foo and then require, uh, requires flaws and then the regular flaws. That's how function concepts work. Yeah, I, I know this is not how function concepts work, but. Is it, is it, like, what do you like, how do you pass the argument? Which argument? Ha the function type. How do you pass in the function type? You have to you have to give this concept a function type. <laughs> How do I? That's actually not a wrong comment, but I'm not going to repeat it because how do I pattern match on it? Yeah, that's for me to figure out. Great. What? Yeah, I have to have some other thing, yes. Thank you for reading my slides before I, they actually show up. So I write a concept because frankly this is this is like the nicer like this requires thing is nice. I like this. I would like to like be able to write bool constant requires. There's been a proposal for that, but I like some people didn't like it. What? It got out of EWG. Did it? Yeah, and didn't make it past other I didn't care how it went to other things. Surprising. Yeah. Okay, so so the comment is that it got out of EWG and didn't get past plenary. Wh which plenary? Yeah. Yeah, I remember it existing. I, I like didn't follow exactly what were what, what uh, it might have been Walters, yes. Yeah, I think it was Walters, I don't remember what happened. Well people didn't like pulling out parts of the Oh, right, okay. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. It's not in seventeen anymore, but it got Became a change in the CS. Yeah, I, I thought it was new an update for the yeah. It's yeah, not yeah, a yeah. hip vehicle yet, but it's a, f a flag for the CS, is my understanding. Okay, so the comment is that it didn't pass the plenary to go into seventeen, but it got up the change to allow requires inside the bool constant argument uh, has been applied to the TS. The concepts. Yeah. The concepts TS. Yes, that's after the published version. After the yeah, published yeah, version. Yes. TS working paper. Yes. Yeah, exactly. To the concepts TS working paper. Yes. Thank you. So, so I basically write a concept to unconcept it, and then put it into a concept. I yeah, like I will have to implement this, and I, I I'm very curious what's the error messages that GCC will give on on uh, unfulfilled uh, requirements, because I I have like a feeling that it will just say this concept doesn't work because I don't think it can do anything else. Are you going to tell me I'm over time? <laughs> yes. Yes. I have, I have like uh, four slides, yes. Aren't you glad that I lied to you now? No. Okay, so, so, so like this is not great. Like I would like something else. Uh, 
So there is this nice thing called virtual concepts. It's a 90 odd pages paper by Andy Pro on like basically getting a type erasure thing out of concepts, like the TS concepts. So this would be a template, but this would not be a template. <laughs> <laughs> This is C++, so we have to invent weird uh, syntaxes. Like, I'm glad this isn't static. <laughs> <laughs> the comment is static would have to be the one with the template. That's actually not a bad idea. So, so if you are interested, it's a, it's a very long paper. Like, there's a lot of text inside. Uh, but it's worth to at least skim for it. Uh, and one of the things that's proposed in the paper and uh, that the author has been discouraged about was like specializations of concepts that would allow you to define a specific implementation of the function for the concept for a given type, which sounds a lot like Concept maps. <laughs> and I have a feeling that if the committee sees a paper with the words concept map inside, it's going to like run away screaming. <laughs> Customization mechanism. Okay, so, so go look this up. Like, it, it's very good. All right, so, so future directions for me, like with this library. Uh, so, so, so uh, actually make use of the, that, awful, that awful thing that I have in the slides. It's going to be a lot, a lot of code, but I think I can do this. Uh, actually generate the concepts, although I don't know what's the actual usefulness. The, the question is whether this was a co comment on this particular use case or on the concepts TS in general. The answer is no comments. <laughs> so, so I have an idea to like let the functions be overloaded. Like, so the alias would be for like something like tuple, something that's tuple like for types. I can do this. I know how to do this. I'm just too lazy to actually. I've been too lazy to actually do this between the uh, submission deadline now. Yes. It seems like there must be some uh, uh, way that language support could could, could uh, help make this easier. The comment is there. There should be some way, some language support thing yeah, to make true. this easier. Yes, it's called concepts with concept maps. Uh, and reflection. Yes. That's all I need. Like, That's all. I, I don't need anything else. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I don't know how many, how many people have built it, but Andrew Sutton has said it's not hard to do concept maps in the concepts TS. It looks different, but he's like, it's actually not very hard at all. So. Yeah. So, like <laughs> so, so the comment is that Andrew Sutton says that it's not hard to do concept maps in the concepts TS. Uh, uh, let's let's like invite Andrew to give a talk about that. I would like to see that. So so okay so so uh, yeah. Doesn't like the first half of your talk just simply go away if we ask for absolutely addressable types so that you would be able to specialize. Like like the struct the like like the temp like the template blah 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 struct colon colon std colon, yeah. colon yeah I said that. Yeah, that would be really nice. Yeah. Uh, okay, so so uh, I kind of have this idea of using Dino actually as a backend for this. Like, without reflection, I will still need some crazy macros, but they will be slightly less crazy, and the whole thing will be customiz customiz customizable. And Louis actually said when I told him that I would like to use it as a backend, he said that we actually intended. Dynot for for this purpose for people to build upon it. So I think I will do this at some point. 
uh, and uh, like soon I'm going to start like trying to use this in a non-trivial project. So we'll see about that, how that works. Uh, there is some additional funkiness with some template things, but I, I can show you how a functor looks like, like the functional programming functor looks like with this, if you want, after the talk. Uh, okay, so so a quick summary. Uh, I, I want types to be ty first class. It, like, there are some places where it helps. And I, I, I need concept maps. Can you clarify what you mean by types to be first class? Because I, I think I know what that means, but... Uh, I want types to have a type. Yes, that would solve all of A lot of problems. problems. That would solve very many problems, yes. Yeah. Uh, and there's actually been some, uh, I, I, I wasn't at Luis's talk, but I think he had some slides uh, where he basically did like vector of meta info objects and did some manipulations on the members and so on. Uh, I could work with that. Like, I'm okay with that. So if you, you're saying if you just had introspection, this would... Uh, and code generation. Okay. I'm generating members. I have yeah, to have like code generation for at least for identifiers. And I think the concepts TS needs also needs the uh, type erasure in one way or another. And that would be all. Any questions? <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Do you think it's feasible to do I think that it's feasible for the TS to be accepted at it as is? Do you mean accepted into the working paper? No, into a standard. On, into a standard. Into standard. No. Okay. I, I think it's not feasible, ignoring runtime, ignoring type erasure, I think, I think it's not feasible for the current TS to become a part of the international standard as is. <laughs> Uh, I don't think it would, but I don't think it's feasible for it to get in yeah. currently. <laughs>